welcome. It's great to be together today to worship. We move into the second Sunday in Epiphany. I want to welcome all of you that are here with us in person, all of you that will be listening to this later on the internet. Uh, nothing happens by accident in God's world. Whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever your story is, you're here for the right reasons. God has in mind for you today to be part of our worship. So as we gather, we acknowledge that we're on the unceded lands of the Wasanic and Coast Salish peoples, closest here to the Sayout, and we give thanks for the grace and dignity for which we're received by First Nations people in Canada, and as we continue the journey of reconciliation, the journey towards truth, listening to truth, believing truth, the journey away from blaming victims, minimizing or denying the past. Uh, we look to incorporate into our worship ways of decolonization and deconstructing of colonization. So as we do that, let us look to God. And as we, just before we do that, a couple of short announcements. One is that on the 29th of January, um, COVID willing, we're going to have right here in the morning a uh, gathering uh, for training for confirmation. There's a diocesan confirmation planned in the spring, later in the spring, and anyone keen to come to that, be in touch with myself and we'll be meeting here. I believe we decided at 10 o'clock in the morning to lunchtime. Lunchtime we'll have pizza and then we'll call it a day. And we're probably going to have about three or four of those over the next few months, but we just, that's the first one. So really good if you can be at it if you're looking to be uh, receive confirmation. The other is that you're going to, you've already seen and will continue to see announcements about different Lenten studies. I know it's a ways away still, but Part of it is to prepare you in the ones where you have to purchase books. There's really going to be at least three different, three or four different Lenten opportunities around the parish and the diocese this year. So uh, you're going to hear one this week. Leslie and Barb Bailey are leading a study um, about women in the Bible, um, for women in the parish. And you you've, will have heard the one that I have put out on the Book of Forgiving with uh, Desmond Tutu and his daughter. Don't know if anyone can help me with pronunciation of her name. Mpho Tutu? I believe it's spelled M-P-H-O. We'll have to learn the proper pronunciation. So as we think of these important matters and as we think of today in the journey of Scripture, today a wedding in Cana, let us bow our heads and look to God. God, we come before you and we ask you to be with us as we worship this day.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, to you all secret, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us continue as we pray. O God of steadfast love, at the wedding in Cana, your son Jesus turned water into wine, delighting in all who were there. Transform our hearts by your spirit so that we may show forth the light of your love as one body in Christ. Amen.
Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glories, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Will you join me in prayer? God of the ordinary, God of the common, you meet us in everyday places and everyday people. Allow us to be open to you moving in and between us and draw us closer to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm pleased uh, to be able to speak to you this morning. Thank you to Lon for the opportunity to, to preach this morning. I want to take you this morning to the place where I'm from, on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, my hometown is called Greenock. The same issues that you hear about in Northern Ireland are present in the west coast of Scotland. The kind of animosity between Roman Catholics and Protestants. It's not as if they fought a reformation, they are fighting a reformation. It continues to be on. So my story begins this morning in a Roman Catholic church, which is called the Chapel in the west coast of Scotland, in this chapel. And there's a problem in the, this little chapel, this little church, because the roof is leaking. So the local parish council go out, and the lowest bidder is a Protestant company. And so they come to fix the roof. And at the time they are up there fixing the roof, one of the workers notice Maisie McGrady, a devout Roman Catholic, kneeling at the altar. And just to the right of her is a statue of Jesus. And one of the workers say, let's have some fun with Mrs. McGrady. And there's a hole in the roof, and he puts his head through the roof, and he says, Maisie, Maisie, it's the Lord. Maisie doesn't even move. She continues in prayer. Goes, Maisie, Maisie, it's the Lord. I'm talking to you. And Maisie keeps on working away with her prayers. Finally goes, Maisie, Maisie, it's the Lord, pay attention. And she looks up and she says, would you be shutting up? I'm speaking to your mother. <laughs> it's good to speak to Jesus' mother. <laughs> it's good to have a conversation with her because she gets things done. We'll come back to the mother of Jesus in a bit. It's a great story. It's a great, great, a powerful story. Like all of John's gospel, it's deep and rich in meaning, this story of a wedding. 
Again, growing up in Scotland, I'm proud about your culture and your history, but weddings are big events. They were huge events, huge gatherings. Um, some say a Scottish wedding is an event to experience. And that's certainly true in Palestine in the time of Jesus. Because this event, this wedding in Cana, was much bigger than the couple who were being married. It was much bigger than both the families who were there. It was a whole event for the village, the community, to gather together in an honor-shame society as Jesus grew up in, where some people are honored and some people were shamed. It was huge that you pulled off a really good wedding. And that was evident in how you put things together. We might call it the stag, the groom, the best men, the males. They were really responsible for the wedding. They would go together. They would make sure the, the food was all there, and especially all the wine, everything was there for the, the party. And in this particular wedding, something, as you hear in the story, happens. And they're running out of wine. A disaster. Absolute disaster. Shame, not only on the couple, but on the families and on the whole village. Did you hear over there in Cana? Did you hear, Mrs. Smith, that they ran out of wine at a wedding? What a group of people is that? Couldn't organize themselves without a paper bag. It's interesting that the steward goes to, uh, to Mary, or the mother of Jesus, as she's called in John's Gospel. She only appears twice, here at the wedding in Cana, called the mother of Jesus, and at the cross. The mother of Jesus is present at the cross. You see, in John's Gospel, there's not really any miracles, although we call this the miracle of turning water into wine. There's no miracles. There's no parables. There's no little sayings of Jesus. There's no mount of transfiguration. There's no temptation. The focus of John's gospel is not the resurrection, it's not the ascension, but it's the cross. My glory, Jesus says. It's the cross that is a central activity of. And Mary is there at his first sign, because they're called signs in John's gospel. The sign pointing towards something. There's seven of them, bookended by two stories that you find nowhere else in Scripture. The story of the turning water into wine and the story of this man, the raising of Lazarus. Those are the signs. They point beyond to something else. There are signs of what is to come. So here at this wedding, the steward goes to Mary. Why did he go to Mary? We don't really know. But usually if it's a problem at a wedding, you would go to the mother of the groom. You go to the mother of the groom, and you say to the mother of the groom, there's a problem here. This party is on the verge of becoming a disaster because we're running out of wine. So is this a relative of Jesus? Is this a brother of Jesus? We don't know, we're not told. But also Jesus has an important role in this wedding as well because it's to him that Mary goes and says, look, we're running out of wine. Do something. This party is going to be a disaster. It's going to be a shame. It's going to be trouble. Can you do something about this? And he's quite curt. No, it's not my time. Go away. I'm not doing anything. It's not my time has not come to his mother. And she goes off. And like all mothers do, <laughs> she goes and she says, do whatever he says. <laughs> do whatever he says. Because she knows something. She knows that something's going to happen. So then the amazing happens. There are present Six huge jars, which are used for the Jewish rite of purification. Six water jars that are present there. Usually families would have one or two, but this family has six of them. 20 to 30 gallons. It's a heck of a lot of water. 20 to 30 gallons. It's a heck of a lot of wine. This is why this is one of the most popular pieces of scripture in Anglican tradition. <laughs> it's an awful lot of wine. 
And Jesus, in a kind of nonchalant way, says, go fill them up. Go fill them up. And fill them up, and behold, they become wine. And the, it's a great scene when the, the steward comes and says to the, the host, said, usually people give out the good wine at the beginning, and then when everybody's drunk, give out the cheap wine. But you have kept the best wine till the end. I like that. I like that for older people. Because we always think our role is over when we get older. Our jobs are done, but God keeps the best till the last. God keeps the best till the last. So don't throw in your heart just yet. God's got something for you to do. God's got work for you to do, and God will call you and give you the best wine at the end. There's a number of different messages I think we can draw from this passage of Scripture. As I said, this is a heck of a lot of wine, wine. 180 gallons of wine, that's a lot of wine for any party. That's enough wine for this wedding. Jesus has produced enough wine for this wedding. Jesus has produced enough wine for this village. Jesus has produced enough wine for Israel. Jesus has produced enough wine, brothers and sisters, for the whole world. In this wedding, and through his life and his death, Jesus has produced enough wine for us. Rich wine that will change us and transform us. So what does it mean for us in our day and age? What does it mean for us personally? What does it mean for us as a congregation at this time? John's Gospel in this particular story tells us things are going to change. Things are going to be different. Things are going to be amazing in your presence. God is going to use ordinary things to make extraordinary things happen. God is going to use common things to make the uncommon happen. So there's that scene when Jesus is approached by his mother and he says, don't bother me right now. Don't bother me. Are there times in our life when we are approached by someone who has a word for us, who is going to tell us something, and we dismiss them? We don't want to hear them because they're older. Do we dismiss them because they're not the same color as we are? We dismiss them because they are foreign. We dismiss them because they are only a child. There is a song by a UK group called Oasis, which says these words, which I think are really important for us in light of this gospel, but also in light of what we've been through nationally and internationally. Because we need each other, we believe in one another, and I know we're going to uncover what's sleeping in our soul. And I know what we're, we're going to uncover, what's sleeping in our soul. And this interaction between Jesus and Mary, Jesus dismisses her at first, like he dismisses other women in the Gospels, but he learns from them, and he himself realizes who he is in those situations and what he is called to be and called to do. Is this one of these situations when Mary uncovers what is sleeping in Jesus' soul. Are these situations when we open up ourselves to those in our midst, to those in our families, to those in our friends, to those in our congregations, and we discover what is sleeping within our soul? God keeps the best to the last. Be ready to respond to what God is calling you and me to do. And as congregations, we hear all the time that we're running out of wine. As a Christian church, we hear all the time we're running out of wine. People are saying to us, friends, this party is slowly becoming a disaster. The Christian faith, the Christian church. There is a time, and I believe it is this time, when the water 
will be turned into wine. But we can no longer be satisfied with the water. We can no longer say this is the fullness of what God has given to us, the fullness of what God has promised us. We're just happy with this water. This gospel points us to the reality that God is doing something new in our midst. And that the church that we know, that the Christian faith that we know, in our generation, we turned from water into wine. Friends, if you can't hear that from Jesus, talk to his mother. She'll tell you. Join me in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we thank you that in this time and in this place we meet you. We thank you that you have in store for us a wine of new life, a transformation for us as individuals, as families, and as communities. We asked to uncover within us what is sleeping within our souls. Amen. As we respond to the words of Scripture and the sermon to open our hearts to it, let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll now have a time of prayer. Leslie will facilitate us in that. The response to our prayer today will be, Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, we thank you that in these dark days, your light continues to shine bright. May we continue to shine your light to all who find themselves in dark places. Lord, hear our prayer. Your love, O Lord, is priceless, and your loving kindness is available to all who seek refuge in you. We thank you for the abundant life that you offer, which can only be found in your saving love. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, we once again ask you to bless your church. In this worldwide communion, we fail and fall, and yet you never abandon your people. May we continue to be a bold people of faith who generously offer your good news to all. Lord, hear our prayer. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Church of England, for the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin, and in the Anglican Church of Canada, we pray for Linda, for Lynn, and for Mark. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for Anna, our bishop, Adela and the Two Saints Ministry, and Leslie and the Diocese of Yukon. We also pray for Father Rolf and the people of the Roman Catholic Saanich Peninsula Parish. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, we lift up all those who are in authority. You call all people to be true of heart. And so we ask you for selfless, generous, and wise leaders to govern us. We pray for indigenous councils, our Prime Minister Justin, our Premier John, and our Mayor Ryan. And this week we ask that you be with Dr. Bonnie Henry as she continues to work with the province to slow the spread of the Omicron virus. We pray for all exhausted and overwhelmed leaders of medical facilities. May you give them moments of rest and peace. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, you have entrusted this world to our care. When we stand at the expanse of ocean or gaze up at the strong mountains, we are in awe of all that you have created. 
We pray for all those fighting for climate justice. May we all come together to lower emissions and save our planet. We lift up all, we lift up all places in the world that have experienced recent natural disasters and for people's homes and businesses that have been negatively affected. Lord, loving God, we thank you for this local community of Central Saanich that we are fortunate to live, work, pray, and play on the traditional lands of the Wasonic and Coast Salish peoples. Continue to create in us hearts of reconciliation that spur us into action. As we move about our neighborhoods and communities this week, help us to notice the people that you have called us to love. In our parish communities of St. Stephen's and St. Mary's, we pray for our upcoming parish council meeting and all those who serve our parish in this way. And we especially lift up our wardens, Deb, Ian, Ken, and Linda. We also ask for prayer for our parish ministers, Lon, Logan, Brett, Bob, Lori, Gil, and Leslie, our VST intern. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, you embrace all those who are ill, physically, mentally, or spiritually, and in need of healing. This week especially, we ask that you draw near to Neville, Alan, Margaret, and Sharon. Please pray out now out loud or in your hearts for those who are ill or in need of prayer in your own lives. We also remember those with long-term needs and friends beyond the parish, and especially this week, we remember our healthcare and frontline workers. This week, we pray for the repose of the soul of Rick Hawkins, and we pray that you be with his family. We also pray for the repose of the soul of Alexa McDonough, who dedicated their life to social justice and blazing trails for women. May light eternal shine upon them. Lord. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together, you will hear their request. Fulfill now our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come eternal life for you, Father, for you, Father, are good and loving and we glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins in a quiet moment, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Peace of God be with you always. Let us share that with one another.
Living God, you have revealed your Son as the Messiah. May we hear his word and follow it and live as children of light. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose love working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our companion on the journey, the one who transforms the ordinary to the extraordinary. Let us live into that transformation. The blessing of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, those you love, and those for whom you pray today and always. And re and rejoice, and again I say, rejoice. Amen. and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.